The season of the grift. Must be the season of the grift, yeah. <laughs> has arrived, and we have a few wild stories of massive scams to get to on this episode, an update on the war on Christmas, and more. But first, these next stories, they took place during and immediately following our most recent holiday. And we should probably start there, since they are the most time-sensitive, and uh, they're uh, maybe not the most outrageous, but pretty outrageous. So buckle up, because it's time for a ride in the clown car. Honk honk! So this segment isn't so much a news story as it's just an acknowledgement of the absurdity of one specific appearance at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, which always seems to have at least one comically horrific thing happen. The past few decades of this parade have given us famous incidents like the Barney balloon being ripped limb from limb in front of millions of horrified children, the cat in the hat smashing into a lamppost, knocking it down onto a crowd of people and injuring many of them, and an incident that happened hours before the start of the parade in 2012, which has been immortalized as an internet meme, where Spider-Man appears to be eating Uncle Sam's ass. Mm -hmm. Must be a shibby fan. <laughs> This year, it was a bunch of McDonald's characters who were immortalized by the internet after being photographed in the style of not one, but two separate world-changing events from modern history. The Kennedy assassination and the Tiananmen Square massacre. Yeah, not exactly lighthearted fair, but... Uh... No, both very fun events. <laughs> the first image was accurately being described as JFK coded after it made its way online during the parade last week, with others referring to it as a frame from the McZap Ruder film. <laughs> and it makes total sense. Now, first of all, yes, the photo literally looks like a presidential motorcade in a giant clown shoe car with Grimace in the role as head of state, positioned in a way that presidential motorcades have clearly avoided since John F. Kennedy was assassinated. But it's also the fact that this photo was taken after weeks of nonstop JFK-related content due to the 60-year anniversary of the assassination in Dallas happening just one day before the Macy's parade. So it was on everyone's minds. If you popped over to the, the History Channel or anything like that, it was non-stop JFK for weeks. But also, as people have pointed out, um, unrelated, but President Joe Biden officially became the longest-serving Catholic president in American history last Take week. Take that, John F. Kennedy. But yeah, the image is, it's incredible. The angle, the style, the fact that the Hamburglar seems to have been collateral damage and is succumbing to his wound, wounds in the photo. Yeah, he's governor, um... The governor of Texas, I guess. Yeah, really the good. other guy that died. No one remembers him. No. Sorry, buddy. Uh, so, yeah, this photo, it's, it's, honestly, it's incredible. It, it should be in a museum. In a museum. Take it to the Smithsonian, put the, it right next to the other stuff. The Grimace's biggest mistake was refusing to send air support during the Bay of Pigs yep. invasion, thus dooming the uh, unit sent there, and thus uh, infuriating the CIA uh, lifers who mm -hmm. felt that uh, the Grimace was being a little too soft on communism, mm -hmm. and he had to go. Yeah. It's like a, a Grimace movie would be like Forrest Gump, except he gets involved in all the wrong ways. Yeah. He's responsible for all the bad things that what? happen. What? Me? President? <laughs> uh, another angle tells more of the story, but has also been pointed out as a visual reference to another historical tragedy the Tiananmen Square massacre, and the Tank Man photo. In the Mick Zapruder photo, you can see dozens of Palestinian flags in the background, and in the second photo, taken from a different vantage point, you can see that the clown shoe car was actually being stopped by protesters using the event to draw attention to the massive death toll in Palestine, with people gluing their hands to the street and unveiling a sign that reads, Genocide then, Genocide now, Free Palestine. This was done directly in front of the clown car, clown shoe car, yeah. carrying Grimace and the Hamburglar, which was brought to a halt so that it wouldn't run over the protesters while the world watched. Yeah. Had cameras not been rolling, anything could have happened. Yeah. Uh, the Grimace, emboldened by the support that he received during his month-long birthday and not satisfied with simply poisoning people with his milkshake, he could have easily just ordered the shoe car to continue on its route, if not for the millions watching live. Yeah. Bad things could have happened. And, I mean, if this had happened in another state where they've now legalized running over protesters. If this was in Florida, yeah, ooh, they would have watch been, out. Would have gone gone very badly. Mm -hmm. That's what they get for dethawing the grimace and bringing him back out this year. Bad he, things can't happen. He's a taste bud. <laughs> I thought he was a milkshake, and that's why he had the milkshake. Nope, he's a taste bud. Well, he belongs in jail. He belongs, yeah, put him away. Mm-hmm. But like we said, the rest of the year's holidays are behind us, and it's, it's full steam ahead. And time to start wishing everyone a Merry Griftmas. 
because these next two stories rival even the Fire Festival in regards to sheer scale and level of deception. Now, for many retirees, a life on the open ocean or sailing down historic rivers, docking at exotic ports of call, that's a major goal and far more exciting than sitting around in their hometowns or at the retirement home doing the same monotonous tasks day in, day out. Getting roped into babysitting your snotty little grandkids? Yeah. No, get me the hell out of here. And we've talked about this phenomenon before, but taken to its extremes, old people will sell everything they have and spend their remaining years on board cruise ships, venturing around the world until they ultimately die, making their final voyage down to the cruise ship's morgue. Yes, cruise ship morgues exist, and yes, people do do this. Yeah. Uh, the cruise at the center of this story wasn't going to be as extreme as that, but it did sound like the trip of a lifetime for anyone who was willing to spend a significant chunk of time on vacation. Yeah, so we mentioned old people and retirees because it's hard to imagine anyone else who has a full three years to spare. Mm -hmm. But we're sure that there's a decent amount of folks who would do something like this if they worked remotely and weren't responsible for raising kids or something. But let's be honest, it's probably just a bunch of old people. Yeah, I don't know if the internet... I haven't been on a cruise in so long. They got internet out there on the water now, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'd imagine so. It's satellite internet. Okay. You're running everything through uh, Starlink, probably. Probably not too fast, though. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, it's a once-in-a-lifetime getaway, and it was being promoted by a company called Life at Sea Cruises. You've heard of Semester at Sea? This is Life at Sea. Yes. And that, this would take passengers around the world, visiting hundreds of ports, 140 countries, and seven continents over the course of three years. Mm -hmm. The cruise would be all-inclusive, meaning that once you paid for your room, everything else, except for maybe excursions, and of course alcohol, would be included in that price, which, by the way, started at the reasonable sum of $30,000, which would obviously increase based on the room preference and add-ons. Yeah. If you want a window in your room, <laughs> like like the king of fucking England over here, oh, you, you need to see when the, the sun comes up and goes down. God. We'll put a, a, a LED behind a porthole and make it rise when the sun's actually rising. Give you the perception that you have a window. You don't know any different. Yeah, and that way when it's storming out, it's beautiful inside your room. It's always sunny in the middle of a cruise ship. But still, $30,000 to be completely taken care of for three years of, of your life. It's a good deal. While getting to explore a large chunk of the planet, it, it, it's a good deal. It seems like it might be too good to be true in some cases. And unfortunately for all of the people who signed up for this trip and then liquidated their bank accounts, and in some cases sold their assets, including their homes, it actually was too good to be true because the trip was canceled right at the last minute after weeks of confusion and chaos, which resulted in the company finally admitting that actually, well, they can't take anyone on this cruise because there is no ship. Yeah, you're going to need that. That's you, kind of step one. You can't really go on a cruise without a ship. And it seems like owning a cruise ship would be the first step in a cruise ship company's plans to sell cruises. Yeah, you'd probably want to check off that box before you really proceed with any of the rest of this. Yeah, but these days, it really seems like a lot of business models are just, you know, sell the product first, and then you just worry about making it a reality much later. This is like a Kickstarter, yeah. but taken to such an extreme. Yeah. With more on what might be this year's version of Fire Festival for old people, here's Sienna. After weeks of silence, the company has acknowledged to passengers that it has no ship and has canceled the departure, vowing to refund those who signed up for cruises, costing up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. The cruise was originally due to depart Istanbul, Turkey on November 1st, but shortly before that date, departure was postponed to November 11th and relocated to Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and then to November 30th, again from Amsterdam. But on November 17th, less than two weeks before the third departure date, passengers were informed the cruise was off. Some of the passengers who booked the 111 cabins sold are still in Istanbul, having made their way there ahead of the original departure date. Others say they have nowhere to return to, having sold or rented out their homes in anticipation of the round-the-world voyage, as well as jettisoning their possessions. <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> what am I going to need this for? Well, I'm going around the world. But don't you feel so much, you feel liberated having shed all your possessions? Now you can do anything. You can't travel around the world on a ship because the ship isn't real. But really, like, you can do whatever you want. Did you really need all of those possessions if you were willing to give them away for a three-year cruise? Probably not. 
they obviously weren't that vital to your survival and happiness. Yeah. If you were like, well, I'm going on a cruise, get the fuck out of here, and had a big garage sale of all your stuff. It actually probably is a big weight off their shoulders. Yeah, and, there, and there's things you can do. Uh, it's not as glamorous, but a, a popular thing with retirees is, uh, you know, downsizing a bunch and then buying an RV and yeah. just living year-round, Travel. traveling North America. Yeah, beautiful country. Uh, yeah. Stay away from the weirdos. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of options here, and maybe they'll take, take up some of those options. Who knows? But for now, they're stuck in Turkey. At least 100 of them are. Uh, quote, there's a whole lot of people right now with nowhere to go, and some need their refund to even plan a place to go. It's not good right now, said one passenger who wished to remain anonymous until they get their promised refund. I'm very sad, angry, and lost, said one. I had the next three years of my life planned to live an extraordinary life, and now I have nothing. I'm having a hard time moving forward. I was proud and feeling brave. Now I don't trust anyone or anything. I know it'll work out and life will go on, but I'm uncertain of the direction. Another said they felt incredibly sad and incredibly betrayed. The company seems to have no consideration about what they've done to our lives, they said. I never imagined I'd be in this position as a senior citizen. This is like almost, well, maybe, maybe more, maybe less fucked up than that uh, scam, like Mars colony that oh, was going yeah. on in reverse. Well, at least that one you knew was never going to happen. Not the people who signed up. Well... They're like, yes, I'm definitely going to Mars. My life finally has meaning. Uh, I th with this, this better happen. This feels more messed up simply because people do do this. Yeah. This is a thing that people do. So it's not... Three years, is, that's a lot. Especially, I guess, as we'll get into, if you had done any research into this company, you would see that they did not have a boat ready. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I guess the believability of this one versus another is... At least somewhat believable, I guess. Uh, as for exactly what the hell happened, uh, it looks like the cruise operator was trying to purchase a cruise ship only for the deal to fall through after they'd spent years marketing and selling the lengthy excursion. Life at Sea Cruises had been planning to buy the Ada Aura ship, retired this summer by Ada Cruises, a German subsidiary of Carnival Corp. It was due to be rechristened as the MV Lara. The company had originally slated the sale to go through by the end of September before working on the ship in a dry dock in Germany, then renovating it before sailing to Istanbul to start the cruise. But after six weeks of uncertainty, during which Life at Sea repeatedly told guests that the sale was taking longer than planned, on November 16th, another company, Celestial Cruises, announced that it had bought the Ada Aura. A day later, Life at Sea's former CEO Kendra Holmes, who had resigned days earlier and said she was not speaking on behalf of the parent company, Murray Cruises, recorded a 15-minute video for passengers, admitting that the cruise would not be going ahead. And yeah, it, it is absolutely wild that even if this had worked out perfectly the way that it was intended to, a ship would not have been purchased until this past summer, then would need to go through all of the necessary refurbishments and the upgrades that they were going to do the, do the rooms. The pictures were beautiful. Renderings? Yes, renderings. Yes. Uh, and all of that, and then just be... Uh, ready to set sail for three years, just two months after they had purchased it. Yeah, that's cutting it a little, a little bit close, I think. Yeah, I mean the ship was clearly operational. They just needed to redo it the way that they wanted to with their branding. Well, they had and to redo get, all the rooms. They needed to get the ship first. Yes, that would be step and one. And not be outbid on it. Yeah, they were really banking on this one specific ship going to them and no one else. Yes. The, it was a bold move, and it did not pay off. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the parent company threw the blame around quite a bit, at one point blaming the missing vessel on the conflict between Israel and Palestine. <laughs> There's a big Middle East con uh, conflict it's, going it's on right now. New, we can't do it. It's the new COVID. Yeah. You know, Hamas. But also, they claimed that they had other ships lined up, and those fell through as well. I'm, I'm totally sure that that is true. We got not binders lying. full of ships. No, it would be stupid as hell for us to barely just, you know, for this entire plan to hinge on this one specific ship. Mm -hmm. Will you take us for fools? No. It, all the ships we wanted to buy fell through. All well, of them. One of the quotes that was uh, within this article was basically like, well, we did, we did have other ships, but they didn't meet the standards that we know that you, the consumer, were expecting. So You know what else doesn't meet the standards? Not going at all. Not having any fucking ship at all. Come they on. should have they should have done like a big reveal and then been like, oh my god, someone stole the ship. Yeah. While we were all ready to go, 
We uh, our bags hey. were packed too. Believe. What me. a story, though. And you know what? We all we have the cruise right here in yeah. our hearts. We all got to experience something miraculous. A, you know, a, a, the ship once was in a lifetime experience of having cr your cruise ship stolen from yeah. you. Yeah. Right before we were about to unveil it, and You're, it was beautiful. You'll be telling your grandkids about this. Uh huh. So yeah, they claim that passengers will be reimbursed for the trip over the coming months, but uh. I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> Let's wait until those checks are all cashed yes. before we uh, before we give any credit for that. Yeah. And even if everyone is fully refunded, they all they had to upend their entire lives in order to take a three year cruise. So financials aside, that's going to be a huge bummer for these folks. Most of whom, again, we assume, are seniors. Mm -hmm. However, if they do feel so inclined, they they could just get a cruise from the same CEO who jumped ship to another company during the fallout. Seems like a bad idea, but here you go. Life at Sea's erstwhile CEO, Kendra Holmes, who resigned last week, claims she's planning to offer a new <laughs> long-term cruise with a different company. Uh -huh. In her 15-minute video address to Life at Sea passengers on Friday, despite having already resigned from the company, she solicited interest in a long-term, round-the-world cruise offered by a new company that she'll be working with, which she named as HLC Cruises. Mm. Holmes told stranded Life at Sea passengers that if 60 or 70 of them transferred to the new company, they'd be able to get something going by the first week of December. Wait, wait, again, the timeline, what are you doing? What are you doing? Have a more realistic timeline. Like, if she had said, like, oh, this time next year, I'd be like, yeah, you know, maybe. It was just, oh, two weeks. <laughs> no, don't cancel those plans. Stay in Istanbul. Stay in Istanbul. <laughs> we'll come get you. But all you need to do is wire me the same amount of money, because that money's you're good for that money. They're going to give that money it. back. They're, Did she say they have a ship? I didn't hear anything <laughs> about a ship. I, I love the idea of, like, the money you've already spent is fine because you're going to get reimbursed. Be don't worry. That's definitely something that's going to happen. So just send me the exact same amount of money. Yeah. And then we'll get this. Uh, it, but but only if like 60 or 70 of you do it. Yeah. I love it. So like, bully your other passengers. You got to do it now. I mean, look, you, you got to. The ship's ready to sail. You got another 30000 in the bank. You give me that 30000 and then the old company gives you the 30000 So then it's like nothing. But uh, yeah. And that money's coming any day now. And make sure. Checks in the mail. Make sure you bully the other uh, customers because yeah. we, we're going to need at least 60 or 70 you to quote. Get this thing going. Wow. Yeah, well, I doubt that. Uh, but here's a tip for seniors who are selling their homes or otherwise blowing their money on themselves in their later years. Hey, that's fine. Spend your money how you want within reason. But for the love of God, please make sure you have something left over for your children and their children. Nope. They Boomers, they're hoarding so much wealth that it is staggering. Look at the charts. And financial institutions will do everything within their power to make sure that families get nothing after these people pass. So instead of selling your house, sign it over to your kids. Maybe then they will like you enough to let you stay there after you're done getting grifted. Yeah, that's a bit, like the house is maybe the only thing. But yeah, there's the idea of like inheritance only was a thing when people died in their 50s. Mm -hmm. If you're living till like 80 or 90, all of there's that money, no money left. Yeah, you're going to reverse mortgage your house to have like yeah. an in-home nurse or go to a retirement home. Yeah. Or sell it to so go to like retirement the, home. So the idea of, I mean, inheritance has always been on the upper end of the the class system, but it is very much becoming like a only for the super rich. Because yeah. even people who like did well during their lives, they're retiring at like 65 and living another 30 years and like it's impossible to do. Money's fucking gone. Yeah. But let's move over to another massive grift. One where it's kind of hard to feel bad for the victim, though the shock waves from this grift will almost certainly be felt throughout the entire industry. No more giving crazy people lots of money. Yeah, we learned our lesson. Uh huh. Uh, a director convinced Netflix to give him tens of millions of dollars to make a series. Well, he decided to spend all that money on gambling, crypto, and himself instead. Incredible stuff. Slay King. Mm -hmm. So director Carl Rinch, who is most famous for the notable flop, 47 Ronin, starring Keanu Reeves, was awarded a deal with streaming giant Netflix after a battle broke out over who would get to release his science fiction series about artificial humans, and the final total would end up reportedly being worth somewhere north of $55 million, with absolutely nothing to show for it. Not one finished episode to air. <laughs> Here's the New York Times with what happened to that $55 million, and it's wild. Yeah. Soon after he signed the contract, Mr. Rinch's behavior grew erratic, according to members of the show's cast and crew, texts and emails reviewed by the New York Times, and court filings in a divorce case brought by his wife. 
He claimed to have discovered COVID-19's secret transmission mechanism and to be able to predict lightning strikes. <laughs> Okay. He gambled a large chunk of the money from Netflix on the stock market and cryptocurrencies. He spent millions of dollars on a fleet of Rolls Royces, furniture, and designer clothing. A fleet! A fleet of Rolls Royces! And I'm taking a bunch of people on a cruise around the world. You're gonna love it. It continues, Mr. Wrench and Netflix are now locked in a confidential arbitration proceeding initiated by Mr. Wrench, who claims the company breached their contract and owes him at least $14 million in damages. Get that money! Netflix has denied owing Mr. Wrench anything and has called his demands a shakedown. A wrench down. Yeah, uh, you've been wrenched. Mr. Wrench declined to respond to a detailed list of questions. In a recent Instagram post, he said he did not cooperate with the Times because he expected the article to be inaccurate. <laughs> he predicted that it would discuss the fact that I somehow lost my mind. Spoiler alert, I did not. Um, mm. uh, once again, doubt. doubt. <laughs> The article, it speaks about the show itself, which was sold to Netflix after Wrench had produced a few shorts based on the concept, and they allowed they allowed him to uh, have complete creative control. That's right. Uh. You're an auteur, baby. You've, you've directed exactly one movie, a critically maligned film called 47 Ronin, which no one remembers. Yes, but and now is your time to shine. Here's the keys to the kingdom. Go make the and show. And who are we to get in the yeah. way? Let us know when you're done. Let us know if you need any money while you're at it. Uh-huh. Filming began in places like Brazil, Uruguay, and Budapest. <laughs> and the article continues. In Sao Paulo, the local film industry union dispatched a representative to set after receiving a complaint that Mr. Wrench was mistreating the team with shouts, cursing, and excessive irritation, according to a letter the union sent Netflix's local production partner. In Budapest, Mr. Wrench went days without sleep and accused his wife of plotting to have him assassinated, two people who witnessed the outburst said. In March 2020, as the coronavirus pandemic was reaching U.S. shores, Mr. Wrench asked Netflix to send him more money. Netflix initially resisted Mr. Wrench's demand for more funds, but it relented when he claimed the whole production risked collapsing without an immediate cash injection. Okay. Netflix wired Mr. Wrench's production company $11 million, bringing its total outlay to more than $55 million. Mr. Wrench transferred $10.5 million of the $11 million to his personal brokerage account at Charles Schwab and, using options, placed risky bets on the stock market, according to copies of his bank and brokerage statements included in the divorce case. In the following months, he behaved more erratically. Like many people, he was deeply affected by the pandemic, and he espoused strange theories about the coronavirus, according to text messages and emails reviewed by the Times. When Ms. Rosé went to check on him in June 2020, he took her to a scenic lookout in the Hollywood Hills and pointed at planes overhead. They were organic, intelligent forces that came to say hi, he told her, according to Ms. Rosé's filing in the divorce case. He also sent her texts claiming that he could predict lightning strikes and volcanic eruptions. At Netflix, Miss Holland, too, was witnessing some of Mr. Wrench's behavior. He was sending her text messages, which the Times reviewed, containing bizarre doodles with incomprehensible annotations. I want to know this guy's Reddit account. <laughs> what was he posting in Wall Street Bets? <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, after a few months of this behavior, a Netflix executive named Rochelle Gerson reached out to his team and asked for access to the show's footage. <laughs> Just so we can have a peek at yeah, So they could figure out how to finish it, basically, like, um... We're going to take whatever you've done uh -huh. and just take it off your hands. We'll finish it. Don't worry. But, quote, Ms. Gerson soon began receiving emails from Mr. Wrench in which he claimed, among other things, to have found a way to map the coronavirus signal emanating from within the Earth. This is so much bigger than your stupid little show. Listen <laughs> to me. A few months later, and after contacting the LAPD over his erratic behavior, Wrench was notified they had dropped the project. Mr. Wrench had begun using what remained of the $11 million that Netflix had wired his production company to place bets on crypto. Woo! <laughs> he transferred more than $4 million from his Schwab account to an account on the Kraken Exchange and bought Dogecoin, <laughs> a dog-themed cryptocurrency, according to an account statement reviewed by The Times. Unlike his stock market investments, this one paid off. What the fuck? This is, this man is, this is the craziest part. Yeah. When he liquidated his Dogecoin positions in May 2021, he had a balance of nearly $27 million. Those are massive gains. Like, yes. He is one of the very few people <laughs> who actually made a bunch of money on Dogecoin and got out before it plummeted. And also, uh, in another just stroke of luck, used one of the only exchanges that wasn't brought down. Yeah. At least not yet. Not yet. But, uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, he was hey, able to actually withdraw the money. Yeah. Here you go. It's all here. So he 
he lost a bunch of money, spent a bunch of money, ruined a potential show and potentially his career, but then was able to salvage uh, a very substantial amount of wealth by investing in Dogecoin and somehow escaping it and cashing out. It's just so insane to be better at trading crypto than trading stocks. Yeah. So what? that's the end of the story, right? Happy ending for everyone. He took those millions, made gambling on crypto, and lived happily ever after, right? Nope. No, he didn't. Mr. Rinch then went on a spending spree. He bought five, five Rolls Royces, a Ferrari, a $387,630 Vacheron Constantine watch, and millions of dollars worth of high-end furniture and designer clothing. The tab came to $8.7 million, according to a forensic accountant hired by Ms. Rosés. Mr. Wrench responded in a deposition that the cars and furniture were props for conquest, and that he had paid for them with Netflix's production money. We're going to need five Rolls Royces for the show, so I just bought them, you know, instead of... It's, it's much cheaper than... You're going to better just buy them out. Digitizing or, or renting them, because renting them, you're just throwing money away, obviously. What are you doing? Five Rolls Royces? That's so, which Rolls Royce will I drive today? I want options. Wait, when you have four Rolls Royces, you're like, you know what? Just one more, bro. I, I think. But I'll wouldn't have... you like a little more? <sighs> four Rolls Royces is pretty great, but it's a damning indictment of the Ferrari. He had one Ferrari and said, "That's enough." Yeah, that's, uh, I, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, Rolls Royces. Once you buy one, you will never stop buying Rolls Royces. <sighs> Boy, you will, it you is will an spend all of your money on Rolls Royces. Is, it is an addiction. It's the only uh, car that can survive the coronavirus pandemic and uh -huh. multiple volcanic explosions. So anyways, he's now in court over all of this, mainly battling with his now ex-wife, but looks like all this money will be long gone before any ruling. And his career is torched. So it's not like he has the ability to make uh, money and pay any, pay it back to people that he owes money to. He's done. He went crazy and he ran up a $55 million tab. But I bet it was a lot of fun. I'm sure it was a lot of fun. Although, Although it didn't sound very fun yeah, being Yeah, the mental illness probably, he was probably not having as much fun. But and who knows? Maybe he's having a blast. Keanu didn't come out. He came out sort of clean on this, but despite the movie flopping, he apparently had become close friends with this guy. And when he was producing the shorts to get picked up, he ended up owing someone a bunch of money and Keanu bailed him out. Well, that's just Keanu. He likes to yeah. take care of his He friend. seems like a really good guy. And unfortunately, he probably didn't expect to get the money back anyway. Yeah. But yeah, that's how he got tied into a little bit of this. But Anyway, speaking of uh, people losing their goddamn minds while simultaneously throwing their lives away with one last hurrah, we should probably talk about the dude who appears to have taken too much of, I don't know, something, and decided to make himself at home at Disneyland's classic attraction, It's a Small World. And we should mention right up front that it's hard to have sympathy for this guy at all because he did get completely naked in front of a bunch of kids and families. So, <laughs> mental sanity break aside, he's fucking cooked forever. And because it happened in such a public place, there are no shortage of videos and witness testimony as to what took place. Allegedly. This man allegedly did these things. We have to be very careful with the words. We don't get sued for libel. He allegedly stripped his clothes off. Allegedly. This will be decided in a court of law. <laughs> I guess. I mean, there's <laughs> plenty of video. Of... Allegedly. Who's well, to say what he actually did? A short version, yes. <laughs> this guy... He started stripping off his clothes, allegedly. allegedly started stripping off his clothes and walking around inside of It's a Small World. He laid down on some props all over the sets. He peeked behind doorways. Hey, wonder what's back here. <laughs> Probably more attraction. Nope, just a wall. Uh, he was basically exploring in his underwear. And then this escalated to what everyone saw posted on social media a little while later. A standoff in and around the man-made river that carries people through the attraction where the perpetrator was completely naked. Uh, he, he looks like, uh, he looks like Daniel Radcliffe playing Weird Al in the Weird Al movie. Okay. Yeah. Um, he was eventually apprehended and then dragged out of the park, well, not dragged, carried out of the park, but, uh, they got like a towel to put up. It's doing very little work. He is being carried out, spread eagle, through the park, <laughs> in front of what appeared to be hundreds of park guests. The, what? Disneyland has a whole... Why are they going through the they, park? They tried to go... Well, there's a back way, but they had to get to it first. Oh, my uh, And also, like, it, it's like a towel, like, this big. They're trying to cover it up with. It's like, no, wrap the guy up in a towel and walk him out. Don't drag him out with his fucking balls 
and grabbed his, his clothes. He, he forgot his clothes. No, the clothes were inside. He started stripping inside, and he was caught outside of it. Oh. So he, like, walked through the whole thing and came out the exit. Wow. But the river part. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, anyways, here's more from local outlet KTLA. Disneyland guests on It's a Small World got an unexpected and unwelcome show Sunday when a man stripped nearly naked and got up close and personal with some of the set pieces on the iconic ride. Officers with the Anaheim Police Department responded to the theme park at around 1.30 p.m. to assist Disney security with the incident. Video of the streaker up to streak. <laughs> yeah, the, I'm streaking. Yeah, no, it sounds like it's not quite that. <laughs> Video of the streaker obtained by KTLA shows the man eerily lit in blue, orange, and pink lights, walking around nearly in the buff to the sound of Christmas music. I am on Small World, and there was a streaker. I cannot believe this is happening. Ashley Escada posted to X, formerly Twitter. Disneyland officials told KTLA that the man stepped out of the ride's vehicle as the attraction was in operation and that park employees stopped the ride as soon as they were made aware of the situation. The 26-year-old man was arrested for indecent exposure and being under the influence of a controlled substance. He was first taken to a hospital as a precaution, Anaheim police told KTLA. And look, it's like we keep telling y'all, set and setting. Don't get all messed up on drugs in public. It's... Never gonna end well. Yeah. Especially at a children's theme park. Keep that stuff at uh, Six Flags. If you're gonna do acid and freak out. Yeah. Do it at Six uh, Flags. You gotta pick the right time and place. And yeah, Six Flags where they don't give a shit. <laughs> hey, whatever. He's a paying customer. He can do whatever yeah. the hell he wants. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Uh, anyways, let's get back to the war on Christmas for a second because Fox News and other conservative outlets are currently losing their minds over the idea that the satanic temple would have the audacity to do what they always do, using religious freedom to hold up a mirror to people who aren't aware that their religion might be potentially encroaching on others. At a Christmas tree festival in Wisconsin, among 65 other trees on display was one that represented the satanic temple of Wisconsin and Bay Area Council on Gender Diversity. Let's just read directly from the Fox News coverage real quick. A Wisconsin museum is facing backlash after its annual Christmas tree festival included some controversial entries this year. Of the 66 trees on display at the National Railroad Museum in, God, why is Wisconsin like this? Ashwabenin, Ash, Ashwabenin, Wisconsin. The, the ones that seem to draw the most attention belong to the Satanic Temple of Wisconsin and Bay Area Council on Gender Diversity. The trees, which will be on display until December 31st, included decorations fitting for their causes and not the typical ornaments depicting images related to Jesus, angels, or the Christmas holiday. They took Jesus out of Christmas. Uh, it continues, The tree belonging to the Satanic Temple was adorned with red lighting and beads, pentagrams, and various ornaments, with one reading, Hail Santa, an apparent, pl an apparent play <laughs> on the phrase, Hail Satan. Who's to say? I, <laughs> <Could be anything. laughs> possibly. <laughs> Maybe they just screwed up when they <laughs> yes. wrote it. The gender diversity tree included pink and blue colored trans flags and ornaments with sayings such as protect trans kids. Oh my goodness. How scandalous. Uh -huh. According to local NBC affiliate WGBA, museum CEO Jacqueline Frank admitted a number of local residents attending the festival had expressed concern over the presence of the trees, but also said some had praised their inclusivity. <laughs> Others took to social media to air their grievances. Outrageous! National Railroad Museum features a satanic worship tree. Matt Batzel, executive director of conservative grassroots organization American Majority, wrote in a post on X, including photos of the satanic display. Some users questioned why the trees would be displayed at a family-friendly event. While another wrote, Why is Wisconsin looking like California? We used to be wholesome and safe. It's time to remember the real reason for the season. Getting mad. Getting fucking mad. Yes, being very angry for a month straight about things that don't affect you in any way. The three wise men off in their kingdoms, they came to visit Jesus because they, they were so mad. Yeah, because Jesus had gone woke. Yeah. Yeah. Pontius Pilate, I'm gonna kill every baby boy because I'm so mad. Ugh! Anyways, finally today, a story that literally doesn't matter. A story that's just on here for fun because we all need some fun. King Herod, not Pontius Pilate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. Yes. <laughs> Back to the fun story. This year's Words of the Year list has been released by oh. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. Oh, my words. 
<laughs> They're all here, folks. The words are all, all here. All the words are here. And they look beautiful. Look at them coming down here the Here she is. She's the word of the year. <laughs> hey, give us Come the full on. 360. Come on. <laughs> and she looks beautiful. Printed on the page. Yep. Look at those letters. Left to right. Oh, well. She's the word of the year. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> the number one Who spot. Uh, the number one spot is not. It's not too embarrassing, which is good. But the reasoning behind uh, this word being the number one word is a little upsetting. Okay. The word of the year. Come on down. She looks great, doesn't she? Pop? Here she is. Twenty twenty three's word of the year is authentic. Authentic is the word of the year. What? That's yeah. a. That's okay. all natural, baby. Yeah. Come on down, authentic. No work done. Uh, here's more from a post on the dictionary's official website. A high volume lookup most years, Authentic saw a substantial increase in 2023, driven by stories and conversations about AI, celebrity culture, identity, and social media. Authentic has a number of meanings, including not false or imitation, a synonym of real and actual, and also true to one's own personality, spirit, or character. Authentic is often connected to identity, whether national or personal. Words frequently modified by authentic include cuisine and dish, but also self and voice. And with the rise of artificial intelligence and its impact on deep fake videos, actors' contracts, academic honesty, and a vast number of other topics, the line between real and fake has become increasingly blurred. Okay. So, I mean, it's a good pick. It kind of encapsulates a lot of the bigger overarching problems from the year. It's the word of the year. The word of the year has gone woke. So here are some more of the, the other words, this, the losers. Yeah, the losers The, the ones category. that were in the running mm -hmm. for word of the year. Sorry, your name is not on the envelope. Er, sorry. So let us know which is your favorite word. And when you do, make sure you use it in a sentence yeah. down in the comments for bonus points. Yes, uh, this, is, this is a great test of uh, how many words you know. Write every word that you know down yeah. in the comments below. What's your favorite word? <laughs> anyway, starting off with Riz. As a noun, riz means romantic appeal or charm. As in, a bro who has riz. It's literally short for charisma. What is this shit? <laughs> as a verb, typically used with up, as in riz up that cutie, it means to charm or seduce. It, it is frequently considered a play on, okay, a play on charisma, but YouTuber Kai Sinat, shown above, widely credited with coining the word, says, nah, that's not what it's from. No other lexical inspiration has been identified. It's it's from char charisma. Yeah, I don't know who Kai Sinat is, but he's, he's wrong. one of the biggest streamers on Twitch. What is he, what game does he play? Uh, I think he does uh, just the IRL content. <laughs> Sounds terrible. Mm. He was one of the highest subscribed Twitch creators this year, I believe. Yeah. So. Okay. And created the word Riz seemingly out of nothing. I don't think he did though. It doesn't mean what you think it means. It means some other secret thing. Yeah. That nobody knows about. Not even the dictionary knows. Haha. -ha. Do they talk about Baby Gronk in this article? Because uh, Livy rizzed him up, and he might well, be the that's new like, It's all king. part of the whole riz thing. But let's move on to more words of the year, like deep fake. The quest for authenticity partly results from technologies like the deep fake, an image or recording that has been convincingly altered and manipulated to misrepresent someone as doing or saying something that was not actually done or said. Dystopian. A number of events this year drove interest in dystopian. A video produced by the Republican National Committee in early April and built entirely with AI-generated imagery portrayed what was widely described as the dystopian future the RNC asserts will result from the re-election of Joe Biden. And the 54th Earth Day celebration on April 22nd, which followed weeks of record high temperatures, came with warnings from activists that action must be taken to avoid a dystopian future. That future was evoked in June when smoke from Canadian wildfires blanketed the eastern U.S., creating a dystopian landscape. And the year was full of dystopian warnings that AI could eventually replace or subjugate mankind. It's, I don't, it's not dystopian anymore, it's just topian. Yeah. We're living in a topia. We live in a topia. Yeah. Implode! When a submersible attempting Ooh. to visit the wreck of the Titanic disappeared in June, the search made international headlines. Titan, the world eventually learned, had imploded. Something that implodes bursts inward or undergoes violent compression. In this case, from the immense water pressure two miles below the ocean's surface. Yikes. Indict. <laughs> yeah. 
Indict was often in the news this year. Former President Donald Trump was indicted on four separate cases, now moving through the legal system, and indict spiked by 9,440% on March 30th when a New York City grand jury charged the former president in the hush money case. Indict is defined as to charge with a crime by the finding or presentment of a jury, such as a grand jury, in due form of law. And there are many more. It's quite the trip down memory lane for this year, which we might do closer to Christmas. Yeah. I don't know. But uh, as always, links to everything, uh, including articles that we mentioned, are always down in the description below. Before you go, please take just a quick second and click the like button on the video. It might have actually highlighted because that feature seems to be working. So click the like button on the video. Leave a comment with your favorite word. What's your favorite word? What's your favorite word? Use it in a sentence. Bet you can't. And be sure to watch our other videos over here, including a new episode of Weekly Weird News with another word that should have been at the top of the list, although it's not new, Orca. Yeah. Well, and Diter, none of those are really new. They just kind of rose up. So I'm surprised Orca was on the list. I'm going to give that Miriam Webster a piece of my mind. Hey, Miriam. You know that word you're looking for? <laughs> watch those videos. We'll be back soon. Bye. Bye.